Hello, and welcome to Middlebury Edition. I'm Middlebury Representative Robin Shai, your host for the program. Middlebury Edition was created primarily for the purpose of educating folks about local services and the Vermont Legislature, and to provide an opportunity for legislators and area nonprofit organizations to talk about their work. Today's guest is Representative Amy Sheldon, who is one of two reps representing Middlebury in the Vermont Legislature. I'm the other one. Uh, this is Amy's fourth term in the House, Amy has been a member of several committees during her tenure, including House Commerce and House Agriculture, and she is currently the chair of House, the House Committee on Natural Resources, Fish, and Wildlife. In her non-legislative life, Amy is a consulting natural resource planner at Landslide Natural Resource Planning, and she's also been on the Middlebury Planning Commission and the Middlebury Conservation Commission, among other things. So welcome, Amy. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, it's great to have you here. It's, it's great to be fun here. Fun to be talking about this stuff. <laughs> So let's first talk about your committee. It's um, House Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. What does it do and what things do you contemplate in your committee? So our committee was reconfigured um, about four years ago mm -hmm. uh, to include natural resources, fish, wildlife, and water. Originally there was a natural resources committee and then a fish and wildlife committee, fish, wildlife, and water. Hmm. Um, and about three, three years ago, I guess, um, Energy and technology was um, removed from natural resources and energy, and the environment, it's kind of, I think of us as the environmental committee now. Uh -huh. And um, so we oversee land use regulations and um, fish, things related to fish, wildlife, and water. Essentially, those are our primary areas of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So when you say, um, so does that include things like fish hatcheries for wildlife, you know, yes. and, and there's hunting and then land use could be planning and zoning in towns and things like that? Is right, that yeah, and there is some crossover with other committees, in, mm -hmm. particularly in that land use area, um, but we, we are the, the, prim the primary committee of jurisdiction with land use issues. So yeah, we do most of the planning and uh, zoning regulation, sort of that area of law, and um, also the Natural Resources Board is our area of jurisdiction and they oversee uh -huh. Act, Act 250. Right, okay, yeah. I like your description of it as the Environmental Committee. That sort of makes a lot of sense to me. I hadn't actually thought about it that way before. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to talk about it. So you've been a committee chair um, for three sessions now. This is your second term as committee chair, right? Correct. Yeah, so um, how does one become a committee chair and how is it different from being a committee member like I am on appropriations? <laughs> I think timing is everything <laughs> in terms of becoming a chair um, and hopefully having the right qualifications. Committee chairs tend to um, either have had broad area of knowledge, expertise to their committee or spent a fair amount of time, I think, in that committee um, mm -hmm. before they become the chair. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think having a fair amount of success before you get to be a chair with with other bills, but also in the committee, and um, then the timing of the previous chair stepping down mm -hmm. really tends to be that. Although uh, we did also, um, you know, a new speaker gets elected, and and sometimes that person will shift chairs around. Mm -hmm. So those are the main mm -hmm. ways mm -hmm. you get there. <laughs> and you certainly have, with your your uh, non-legislative experiences, really devoted to land use planning and natural resources. So you have that deep area of expertise that. I did. I brought that to the table, and also it's certainly my passion. Yeah, um, and I, I care a lot about that. Um, and then, how, did you ask how it was different? I think yeah. um, you know it's different because you obviously have your own priorities that you bring to the table. But as chair, you're also balancing the other members' areas of interest and priorities, and trying to nurture them and elevate them and bring out what they bring to the table and make sure that they are feeling empowered to act within the body uh, with 150 members mm -hmm. there's a lot of us there are a lot of resources to get things done and i see us as that place where um, we're like the cog in the wheel between leadership and the other members and making sure that um, the the priorities of the body get taken up and um, and that all par all members of the body get their voices heard mm -hmm. and you have some say in choosing your committee members, but but not entirely. Is the, how does that work? How do you? It's pretty limited. Um, I yeah. would say. <laughs> I think um, generally folks articulate their preferences, but I think in a lot of ways, 
Um, you know, leadership is, is where that happens and meaning the speaker mm -hmm. chooses, chooses really mm -hmm. who goes where, but I think it's a lot of um, balancing geography and areas of interest and time in the body, how long people have served and understand how things work. So mm -hmm. each committee tries to be balanced with new folks and, and uh, more experienced people and, and like I said, geography to the extent that's possible. Mm. So everybody from Madison County isn't on one committee. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, because, because the state certainly is different around. Um, and uh, and I, I imagine from a speaker standpoint, you know, that's a, that's a challenge in many ways because, you know, everybody's elected and the speaker doesn't pick who's elected either. So you have to figure out what's going to work the best for the body as a whole. Right. And, of course, we also... Um, there's a consideration for what where the person wants to be and mm -hmm. getting as many people on committees that they want to serve on of course makes us a stronger institution right people are more excited and interested in the, in certain areas and um, and then political parties get balanced yeah yeah it's a lot to juggle it's a lot to juggle <laughs> so, so so the extent that the chair has influence is pretty limited after yeah. all that gets figured out right yeah. right yeah. and then you come in and you have to play the hand that's dealt you basically exactly <laughs> that's a great way of putting it what you do. Yeah, so what are some of the challenges of being a committee chair? Well, there's one. Um, <laughs> you know, you get, you get, a, you get the whole spectrum. Um, I, I guess the challenges come at us, I mean, it was, you know, the COVID sessions that we've had mm. about, a, about a session and a half of, well, depending on how you count the summer that we worked, um, right. uh, I think have, have really changed how we can relate to Vermonters, and I think for me may make it uh, more clear. You can you can hear from more Vermonters more directly, and um, the lobbyists certainly had less less influence, I mm -hmm. think, and that was very interesting and exciting. Uh, and we had an ability to bring in more uh, people into be witnesses mm -hmm. and bring us expertise. Mm -hmm. So this past session, in particular, kind of having had part of the previous session via Zoom and kind of committees like mine a little bit put on hold because of the COVID emergency. Right. So we had time to think about how to use the Zoom platform and um, I put a lot of energy this session into bringing in um, kind of like the deep dive into the main areas that we were gonna be working on mm -hmm. just in terms of educating all of us. Yeah. What's, what's going on in this area and um, then, uh, then the obvious next step sort of presents itself mm -hmm. after you mm -hmm. have committee conversations with great witnesses. And yeah. you know, we had witnesses from all over the country and Canada, which was pretty right. cool. And, and that's, that is the upside, I think, to Zoom, is that people don't have to drive two and a half hours to yeah. give 20 minutes of testimony. That's right. We had more witnesses from Southern Vermont. Yeah. Um, they, were, they, were, they were excited to engage. And I think yeah. as hopefully we go back into the building, we can integrate those, the same, that benefit that mm -hmm. comes with it. Mm -hmm. And I think you must have had a particular challenge this time because this past January was the first year of a new biennium. So you had some new committee members, mm -hmm. and there were lots of legislators who were elected for the first time who've never set foot in the state house, right. and we met them all by Zoom, which isn't really the ideal way to meet, you know, your colleagues. Right, right, yeah, it was interesting. Although I'm trying to think, did we even, you know, our I think our only new member um, was Representative Bongarts, and he'd served before. Right. Um, so we had a little yeah. more institutional knowledge yeah. going into it. Um, but I think also the kind of uh, go slow to to be successful. I don't want to mm. say go slow to go fast, but I think right. um, taking time in January and doing those deep dives mm -hmm. into educating us on the issues at hand was very helpful. The challenge can be building the agenda and inviting the right. witnesses. And um, it's not usually a challenge to figure out who you want to have in, but People are busy and getting yeah. them in on your schedule so that it, um, you know, makes sense. I like to kind of have two bills going at once so that mm. we can alternate um, from the pool of witnesses and then also in our own mental, giving people time to process the information they get on a bill before we move forward. 
mm -hmm. can be helpful, at least right. in the beginning. You right. know, and then like sure. the last week before you're going to move a bill, you might dive right into it and debate lots of conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So you said you did a few deep dives in January <coughs> and maybe into February. What were the topics that you were doing that on? Um, well, we also talked trash in my committee. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get to say the, that. The trash queen. When I ran the Solid Waste District, that was my other name, the trash right, queen. Right. right. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't get to say that. We did a lot with Solid Waste. Uh -huh. um, and that brought us to uh, moving um, improvements to the bottle bill out of our committee this this session, oh, yes. which is now over in the Senate side, but we did bring in a lot of um, great, great information on the status of solid waste, but primarily the recyclables and um, the mm. fact that Vermont was really only, with our bottle bill, which was 45 years old, yeah. about, um, you know, it, it was, it's a great thing, Vermonters support it, and it hadn't been updated in maybe since the beginning, I, I can't remember if we added one thing along the way, maybe, oh, we, we added liquor along the way, but um, we, um, I just got distracted, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so, so the bottle bill, you, the you bottle made bill. some changes? We updated the bottle bill, okay. and then we did a deep dive also into um, forests and how important forests can be uh, in or they're just the changing science of forests and oh. understanding that and learning amazing things about forests. Yeah. Like we brought in experts again from all over and, um, you know, with the push for addressing climate change, you know, being mm -hmm. a top priority in the legislature, um, we um, needed, we just need to understand the current science yeah. around that. Yeah. And I, I know I heard, you know, forest fragmentation was something that was coming up a lot. So that was probably part of the forest education piece. And um, a piece of it, although we've yeah. been talking about forest fragmentation for so long. Actually, yeah. no, we got really deep into the understanding of the science of what's happening in old forests. Oh, okay. And um, we, we are very much looking forward to integrating that into conversations we have around um, carbon sequestration and climate mm -hmm. resilience. and. Mm -hmm our committee's role in addressing climate change. Um, and so, hmm. uh, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I just sort of this amazing thing that we learned was that uh, agricultural fields that are adjacent to intact forests are more productive. And so oh. um, when we passed the water bill, that was the, my first biennium, we did the deep, um, the clean water work. Yeah. And we learned a lot about healthy soils. And the ag community's been, you know, working on that since then, but um, to hear that the mycorrhizal fungi that the trees um, have among themselves mm -hmm. also extends into soils adjacent to uh, or the adjacent agricultural soils fields, it was just like, that is so amazing. Wow. Um, and so, That's you know, cool. we're looking at ways, Vermont right now has about one to three percent old forests, depending on how you look, it's pretty hard yeah. to know what's happening on um, on all the private lands, but um, v Vermont has a really great conservation design plan. Um, and we that plan calls for 9% old forest. So we're looking at ways to increase the amount of, of old trees, uh -huh. old forests that are out there in our landscape. Yeah. So that was uh, another area. And then of course we are working still on updating Act 250. Right. And so we had to, um, we, did a, we did that um, kind of land use 101 work mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with new members and new members to our committee. So I mentioned we only got one newly elected member, but we um, have new members to the committee. Right. And also we all need a primer on that when yeah. we are going to start working on it. Right, right. And yeah, you, know, you, you deal with things that are near and dear to people's hearts and therefore emotional and um, yeah. challenging just because of the subject matter that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. there. And one thing when you were talking about the forest made me think about, uh, you know, where that intersection or d division is between your uh, committee and House Agriculture and Forestry. So mm -hmm. is logging coming under you or is that the other committee that works on that? I mean, I imagine you have to discuss, you both have to discuss it, but... We have to discuss it. Um, Forests, from a land use perspective, would stay in our committee, mm -hmm. and um, but from a timber management mm -hmm. point of view, 
um, they're more of the forestry side, mm -hmm. um, and so we have to work together. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's what we need to do, isn't it? That sort is of... what we need to do. <laughs> and you know, I think that there's always debate about the best way to um, to do that in mm -hmm. terms of this sort of um, inside ball. Um, but right. It's a stronger bill when it's seen right. more eyes right. um, when it gets to the floor. Yeah. So that yeah. can be helpful. That's great. So, um, you know, you have complicated and um, challenging bills that you have, and you probably have too many. I think my experience on the committees I've been on is that you often get many more proposals, uh, you know, legislative proposals than you can reasonably deal with in our 18 week legislative session. Mm -hmm. Um, and they go, we talk about them being on the wall because we get little pieces of paper that look like index cards and we stick them on the wall and, and that's how we sort of refer to what we've got. So mm -hmm. how do you decide what to take up when you have so many? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think what you have to look at is like, what's the long view in that area of your jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. And so where do you think Vermont needs to go in the different topics that your committee covers? And then, um, and then what's ready to move? And, and like you said, I have a lot of big complicated bills, but I try to also look for some smaller bills that can improve something that we've done in the past that, that takes into consideration that long view. Mm -hmm. um, but then also um, having, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought again. <laughs> um, having, um, like just being really aware of a you just mentioned the 18 weeks yeah and then having an understanding of what are the things that we can really make a change in legislatively uh, and then thinking about what's uh, most important for us as a as a state and a nation yeah and um and then also what are the people of vermont ready for us to do in that right. area what what's palatable what's ready right. what's ready to move i mean it takes a village to move a bill yes. it's not one person that can do it yeah. and you know it's like multiple layers and levels of um, of engagement yeah and I think when you think about where we are right now kind of in post COVID moment and learning curve of areas where we need to work and you know the climate crisis and you start to right. do you start to really sugar off what's important yeah. and the thing to do is not to bite off m more than you can chew right <laughs> right and that's so easy to do because there's so many big issues that we're dealing with and the yeah. other the other piece i guess i would say is um, one of my favorite graphics on our general assembly website is how a bill becomes law and yeah. it, it isn't just about your committee it's about getting it through your committee and then it's about getting it through the body the house chamber and then it goes to the Senate, and the Senate has to do, right. and then they do their thing. Right. And at the end of the day, the House and the Senate have to agree, and then it goes to the governor, who has to sign it, or veto it, or let it go without a signature. So yeah. it's not easy to get a bill passed, and I think, mm -hmm. I'm not sure everybody understands that, the, that how hard it is. Yeah, democracy is hard work, and, yeah. it's, and it's hard to make changes by design, mm -hmm. and it's not, um, you know, the daily practice of it is not for everyone, right. but um, we certainly need everybody to engage in whatever level they can. Yeah. Um, I think when you think about post-COVID and the stresses that we're under, I think, um, you know, our democracy is, is really threatened, not in Vermont, but as a nation, yeah. and I think that's important. I think the environment is critical, mm -hmm. and... Um, and I think mental yeah. health is a really important yeah. thing that we all need to just, I think, walk with a lot of empathy, particularly yeah. coming into this session and understand that um, we're all at different places in dealing with those, actually three, kind of those three big buckets and um, understand that, that we might need more breaks than we would have in the past yeah. or just a, a, an awareness of the very real challenges that we face. Yeah. Well, you're leading me right into my next question, which is, you know, the issues that you see as important, not just for your committee, we'll get to your committee, but sort of broadly what you think the issues are mm -hmm. uh, for our, uh, for us to be taking up as a body. Well, certainly climate change is right <laughs> at the top, and that's going to yeah. be part of my answer for um, what we're doing in our committee yeah. and how we yeah. fit into that puzzle. Um, we know we have ongoing studies happening in the legislature right now on mm -hmm. priority areas. Um, mm -hmm. Pensions is really key. 
Um, oh, school yeah. waiting is key. Right. Um, COVID recovery is still a priority. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of big things going yeah. on. Redistricting is Redistricting, happening. Redistricting, <laughs> that was the final thing on my list. And so, but you know, we have uh, 14 standing committees in the House and mm -hmm. 150 people working hard. So we have yeah. capacity right. to do more than th those things. So. Yeah, right, right. Um, and I think we've all learned a lot. You pick any, almost any of those topics um, that COVID has in, has impacted. We saw what the what the earth looked like when we weren't all driving and flying, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so how how climate change has made such a big difference and the mental health issues that you talked about. And, and uh, you know, I would just also add that we're we're finding out you know people can't go back to work because they don't have childcare or they can't come mm -hmm. to work. They don't have housing. So we have we have lots of issues. Some pretty important issues to some pretty important do. issues. I think of COVID as a wake up call. Yeah. And as you were saying that, I was reminded of the last time that happened was 9/11. Um, yeah. The world stopped for a little while. Um, I don't think we really woke up then. Yeah. Um, but I hope we wake up now yeah. and we start to change our values and our priorities yeah. um, to to meet um, our needs better than we have been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been going on for so much longer. 9/11 was such a sort of a singular event. It was a wake-up call. Well, this has been but a, that's my a global. Point. Yeah, I this has been a lot longer <laughs> that, that, global that reflection. This, so. this is another opportunity is. to pay attention. It is an opportunity, and, and it is longer because we obviously needed longer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, in your committee, you'll be taking up. You said some climate change. What other things are you going to take up in your committee? So, our, the way we're going to approach climate change is going to be through our land use okay. and area, yeah. and that's going to be looking at. Um, but and and I would include. So, we have climate. We have a climate crisis happening, but at the same time, we also have a biodiversity crisis mm -hmm. happening. And in our committee, the land use comes together on both of those. And if we can kind of um, move the ball forward on protecting our landscape, um, we'll also build that climate resiliency and carbon mm -hmm. sequestration and um, help our communities do better during floods and droughts mm -hmm. and provide a habitat for uh, biodiversity for animals, the critters are going to be moving north, they already are, yeah. and the plants. And so we in Vermont hold a really special place mm -hmm. because of our um, physical landscape in in providing um, refuge, refugia, yeah. refuges for plants and animals yeah. as the climate changes. And yeah. so we're really going to be looking at how do we protect the Vermont landscape and um, and, and again, to like provide those services the communities need, but also um, the habitat that our plants and right. animals need. Right, right, for everybody. Okay, well, we need to wrap up. Any last things you want anybody to know or uh, how they can reach you? I think we'll have your email address um, yeah, that's, at the bottom of the screen. That's, that's the best way to reach mm -hmm. you. If that's the best way to reach me, and I do appreciate hearing from folks. Great. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Amy. It's yeah. been great. Good to catch up with you. Yeah. Um, that's it for now. My guest today has been Representative Amy Sheldon. Thanks to MCTV for producing this show. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you next time.